Hello, Dominic Herbst here with Restoring Relationships, and I want to continually remind you of the Walking Through Calvary experience, which is discipleship. It's beyond counsel. We do need counsel, uh, and God uh, encourages us to seek counsel from the multitude of counselors. However, when it gets to be situations where the gravity of importance the degree of importance is such that you're talking about the covenant of God. It is very, very important that we are walking out the truth that we are being discipled into. Discipling, you see, is not only giving the person the truth that they need most at the place that they're hurting the worst, but it also requires that we walk it out. That's where the transformation comes. It is in the book of James, he said, be doers of the word and not hearers only. In other words, once we hear it, we're to walk it out, we're to do it. And the power of God comes into us and those we love. And the transformation is all him. And many of the transformations are miraculous. They all are because only God can transform us. We cannot change among ourselves in our fallen nature. We can't. He can transform us from the inside out. That's so, so important. Come and join us. Maybe it's for you. Maybe it's for the situation you're in, your loved ones, so that you know and understand how to pray for them and know what to do, what is best for them as you move forward. The uh, topic here is the marriage covenant was established by God. And marriage restoration is only possible through the power of Christ. So, if the covenant is of such a serious nature that it was ordained by God and God alone between a man and a woman, then we have to understand that if that covenant is under stress, is starting to break down, is in conflict, please understand that seeking the power of Christ and walking out in the spirit of his truth is the only complete remedy to having your marriage restored. Marital conflict and divorce is the result of the sin and uncleansed pain in the souls of both spouses. Now, some of you are saying, wait a minute, I'm the victim here. And that may very well be as you assess it from the outward appearance. Man looks on the outward appearance. The Lord looks at the heart. But both hearts are disturbed by what has happened and long before you came together. Why? We're in the fallen nature and the impact of our interaction in childhood, has imprinted upon our souls certain things that we brought into that marriage. I've often said that the marriage becomes the playing field of any of the unhealed wounds of childhood. Yes, the events are in the past, but the impact from those events are imprinted within our soul until we allow the Holy Spirit to come in and cleanse them out from us. The only way to do that is the walking through Calvary discipleship pathway. It is solidly biblical and we open our hearts up for God to come into the place we were hurt the worst. Do you ever notice why we don't reflect on the areas of pain in our life? Because it hurts. And the enemy banks on that so that he can come into that pain and he can torment us within the most painful parts of our lives into the impact areas of our soul that we brought with us into the adult years, even if the events were way far back. The enemy comes into that place where he really does not have a right to be into, but we gave him a legal right by not surrendering the pain to the Lord God. If we don't surrender that pain upward, the enemy has a legal right to come in and torment us in that pain. If you've wondered why it just seems to cause all kinds of difficulty in your interaction with people, particularly those you love the most, so the enemy uses it first and foremost to disrupt our marriage covenant, to disrupt our relationships with our children, with our other family members, extended family, with our closest friends, with the people that we work with, the people we go to church with, so on and so forth. The enemy is going to take advantage of any situation. You say, but pain is not sin. Why does the enemy, why is he able to do that? Pain is not sin. That's true. And Jesus is the only one who can cleanse our sin. And his finished work at Calvary and his shed blood had uh, covered that area. As long as we have surrendered to him our lives, repented for our sin, and asked forgiveness for our sin. Now, the pain 
that was inflicted upon us, not our fault even, in years ago, that pain imprints within us and we retaliate on the basis of what that pain did to us. We think, no, no, I did not remember doing that. You won't. You won't remember it. Because once the enemy comes into that pain that was imprinted in there and uses it to torment us, he puts a blind, uh, I used to say a veil, it's a shroud. What's a shroud? It's a dark blanket that covers death. Well, what he tries to do then, generate the sensation of death in our soul. Uh, example, depression. It's not that your body literally dies. It's that depression comes upon your soul and it puts you in that darkness. And you just don't feel like living, getting up out of bed or doing what you're called to do. Your dreams seem to be in, under the dim light and you lose the sight of your dreams and your visions altogether. God has not taken them from you. He continues to renew them just as he does his mercy and grace every day. But you won't experience it as long as that torment is in your soul. And only God can cleanse you from that torment. You can go to counsel and it's okay. The Bible says in the multitude of counselors, there is wisdom. But no fallen people, whether they're called counselors or pastors, people like me, can ever cleanse you from that pain. Only godly sorrow will do that. So the enemy is clearly, whether you know it or not, whether you believe it or not, doesn't change that he has uh, gone into that area uh, and he has flooded that area with his presence in order to torment you. Even as a believer, he can't take you from the Christ and the finished work that Jesus did at Calvary, provided you have surrendered your life to Jesus. But if there's an area that's not surrendered, even though it's pain, the enemy will come in through legal right to torment you and I in that area. I know I lived, lived it way too long. And I kept sensing the whisper of God. I didn't hear words, but I knew it in my spirit. Dominic, let me know when you've had enough. How many of you are listening now? How many of you will be listening to this later? And you sense, let me know when you've had enough. It's a very gentle voice of the Holy Spirit. He speaks to your spirit. It's his still small voice. The voice of God does not speak to your mind or your head. The voice of the enemy is, but he will represent himself as it's God speaking to you. Be careful. Now, some are able to discern. No, that's not God speaking. That's a that's not of God. God doesn't speak that way or he doesn't make me feel all this kind of pressure. God will convict you of sin, not pressure you, convict you, help you to understand that sin is is causing a, a break in the fellowship between you and the Lord. And he's whispering. He's saying to come and repent of that sin, that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, if we have failed or just didn't know to give our pain into the Lord by opening up and giving him the truth from our inward parts, that's Psalm 51, 6. That's where our discipleship um, uh, uh, travel, the the road to restoration begins is giving the truth from our inward parts. As we pour out, the Spirit of God pours in and brings cleansing through godly sorrow, and he brings wisdom with it. Look at the verse. Psalm 51, 6. Uh, 51, 4 is also coming to mind, but read Psalm 51. You'll see, you, Lord, desire the truth from my inward parts. So if we're holding back pain, even though we don't know we're doing it, Unfortunately, anything not surrendered to God, the enemy has access to. He shouldn't, okay? He's really not allowed, so to speak, but God gave us free will. And if in our free will we withhold it, then the enemy uses that as a legal right because he's going to barge in. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's the enemy, Satan, and all the enemy spirits. So understand, you and I are subject to this, anything we hold back. So even though pain is not sin, it, uh, if we hold it back, the enemy uses it to torment us. Then the seed of contempt through the memory of the people that created that pain in us, even if it was decades ago, a seed of contempt is buried within the soul and the enemy waters it with worldly sorrow. What's that? The depression where you're frustrated and you tear up and you're so, so angry at yourself and other people and some you don't even know who you're angry with. And you just feel this contempt all through you and you sleep and you wake up 
and you feel more tired than when you went to sleep. These are all fruit from a darkened soul, from a soul filled with pain that's becoming infected. See, the wounds created the pain, but if it's not allowed to be cleansed, if we don't open up to God, let him cleanse it with godly sorrow that cleanses and purifies that pain, it will become the breeding ground for the sin that of that comes forth from a root of bitterness. So the root of bitterness actually grows out of uncleansed pain that people inflicted upon us, and the root of bitterness will create fruit, bitter fruit. And the root is called a root because you can't see it. But not being able to see it does not mean it's not contaminating you or infecting your soul. And that's what the enemy banks on because he can blind you. He can blind you to the fact that it's there. That's why if you ask 100 believers, you have a root of bitterness. Probably 99 or 100 will say no. And uh, the ones that say no, I'm suspicious of because... I had a root of bitterness, and if I'm not careful, it can grow out again. It may, it won't have the power of the one that was really rooted in me because God set me free of that. However, the enemy wants to keep growing it in any place that is not surrendered over to God, that, that uncleansed pain. I didn't intend to go into the depth that I am right now with regard to the uncleansed pain, but I believe the Holy Spirit led me here. There is not one who is, belongs to Christ even as a child that has not had uncleansed wounds within their soul, the degree by which those uncleansed wounds are or ordering their lives and actually uh, holding them captive to bitterness, hate, and resentment depends upon the person, how long the wound has been there and, and how long it's been infected. You say, well, how will I know? You ask the Lord, look in, look up. You look in and say, Lord, show me. Show me what I don't see. If you're going to take a note, take that one. There's there's an incessant prayer. God, is something in me that, that's hindering you and I walking together. Something I don't see. That out of it is coming a constant besetting sin. An area in my life that owns me. I don't own it. It owns me. And that's when you begin to see and understand with the revelation of the Holy Spirit, wait a minute, this is serious business. And I'm realizing now that the pain that I'm under causes a, a, a splash out of the root of bitterness. In Hebrews 12, 15, it actually says this, look diligently, carefully in some translations, meaning keep looking. If you look and say, nope, nothing, be careful. That's the enemy lying to you. Keep looking, asking the Lord to show you what you don't see, whereby this root of bitterness springs forth and many be defiled. I look at that as a fountain of sewage. Has stuff sprung forth from you? And you thought, oh, why did I say that? Oh, oh, Lord. Oh, how did I lose my temper on that? Oh, oh, Lord. Oh, why did I do that? Oh, no. Gee, I can't put that back. Oh, this is terrible. All of that is coming from an unseen root. Remember, roots are not seen. But they're evidenced by what pushes above ground. And what pushes above ground is what causes most people to seek counsel. But what push, pushes above ground is, is uh, fruit, is symptom. But those symptoms are debilitating and they're driving a wedge in your most precious relationships. So I am not, I am not minimizing the symptoms, the fruit from the bitter root. The problem is you'll never be free of them until the bitter root is completely destroyed and that area is cleansed and purified by repentance and godly sorrow. Right there. Did you know in 2 Corinthians 7.10 there are two kinds of sorrow? There is godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow comes from the Lord God. Worldly sorrow comes from the enemy. Worldly sorrow leads to death. Now, people say, is my body going to die? Well, not literally, not directly, but your soul begins to die in this sense, that dark shroud there's where the depression is. If you've never had it like I did, you feel dead inside. And one of the reasons why some people take life out of the body is because they felt like they were a walking dead person in their depression. And God help them because God's ready to release them and set them free from that affliction of depression. depression. Depression is not sin, but it's affliction. And it's no way that God intended us to live. So all of this is occurring for God to show you how he can set you free. The enemy brings 
uh, and accelerates this sensation upon you and I in order to keep us bound. But God uses it to reveal to us that he came to set the captives free. He. So we go back to our title. If this is a covenant marriage, and by the way, as you can see, this applies to every relationship. But if this is a covenant marriage, and it was ordained by God, and it had that seriousness that man was not involved in establishing the covenant of marriage, then you, we, you and I have to understand that the healing and the restoration in me and my spouse is totally predicated upon him, the Lord, the one who established the covenant. Well, well what about counselors? Counselors can awaken you to the areas of your affliction and help you understand what is destroying your marriage. But many of you already know that, Okay. And and they can awaken you to that, but they can't cleanse that area. I can't. Well, then what's my value? My value is to awaken you to that truth and walk you in it as a navigator so that the Holy Spirit is walking you in it internally for the cleansing and the purification so that you can be set free. And when you're set free, you won't be bound by what's happening in your soul. God's saying to us, remember what I said earlier? Hey, let me know when you've had enough. Let me know. God's not going to force his way in. He, he gave us free will. So in effect, uh, he gave us the choice to choose what, we're, who, what and who we're going to choose. So Jesus actually said, Moses, because of the hardness of our hearts, allowed us to put away our spouses. But from the beginning, it was not so. That's the bill of divorcement right there. It's referred to as the bill of divorcement in other translations or other, other verses. The bill of divorcement is not God's perfect will. It's his permissive will. It's not what he wanted. He never wanted divorce. And then remarriage from divorce, because of the impact of the pain, is so far reaching. He never intended divorce. And the ensuing pain from divorce causes years and even generations of impact upon the lives of children and families that must be taken into consideration at all levels before entering into divorce followed by remarriage. I'm not in any way forbidding what God has permitted, but we have to understand the gravity of the battle and the situation. The covenant marriage between two people in the natural world is equated with the one-to-one -one communion between you and the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're a believer in Christ, that communion on the vertical level, heaven to home, right here, that covenant, uh, I'm sorry, that relationship with God through Jesus Christ is the same equated to the horizontal relationship between you and your spouse and your spouse and you. That's how serious that covenant is. So, uh, it, and let me read it out. The covenant marriage between two people in the natural world is equated with the one-to-one -one communion between you and Jesus Christ and to any everyone who enters into a personal relationship with Jesus. Now, it requires a full surrender to Christ, repentance for sin, and an, a request of forgiveness for that sin. And Jesus is referred to in the Bible as the bridegroom. He's the groom coming for his bride, and the believer becomes a part of the bride of Christ. So just as the two people enter together in the covenant in marriage horizontally at a, at a marriage event, so it is that when you come to Christ and Christ in you, you are in him and he is in you. That is the communion of a marital union in this spiritual realm. And that's why uh, Paul said in Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. A lot of husbands say, she doesn't submit to me like the Bible says. Well, you've read a piece that didn't have all the meat to it of the truth. And that it says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might, that is Jesus, present it. The, this is the bride of all believers, present the bride to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. See, if the husband is commanded to love his wife as, life, as Christ loved the church and Christ gave his life for the church and he was a servant leader, not a demanding boss, he was a servant leader. If man would do that, 
there probably wouldn't be many, if any, divorces. In effect, man is the, the he's the priest of the home, and he where as he goes, often the whole family goes. Now, can the wife be in rebellion? Yes, and can it contaminate? the communion of the covenant of course it can be it can be from both sides all ends but ultimately it never never gives man a reprieve from the command to still love his spouse as christ loved the church and this business of expecting a submission to a person who is oppressive even abusive we've got to be careful and recognize you've got to read the whole word of god and be obedient to the whole thing all right, so these verses reveal the correlation between the marriage between man and woman as it relates to the relationship between Jesus Christ and the born again believer. When you are in marital conflict, when you're in division and strife with your spouse and possibly headed for divorce, you're drawn by the Holy Spirit to head directly to the throne room of God to be restored before it leads to divorce. Now, I know you're thinking, well, I go to counseling. That's good. There's nothing wrong with that. But oftentimes, counseling becomes the first and only stop. And please understand, the counselor is limited by his or her flesh-based reality. Yes, well, I bring God into it. We pray a lot. It's got to be deeper than that. The counselor has to be one with God in all counsel. The counselor cannot contaminate the counseling process with opinions. I have opinions, you have opinions, but opinions are not the word of God. Therefore, they cannot transform you or your spouse. The opinions may be fun to hear. It doesn't mean you're forbidden to give opinions and hear opinions. But if they're given as if this is what I'm counseling you to do, that counselor has to be very careful because God will hold us accountable. And that's why walking out the counsel in discipleship ultimately hands up, I used to say hands off, hands up the, the spouses to obedience to the word that they hear so that when they walk out the truth, that's where the transformation comes. And then if they look at the counselor and said, uh, I don't think you gave me good counsel. I gave you the word of God. And not only did I give it to you, I've been navigating you in the word of God. Here it is. Every step of the way, here it is. If this is not the word of God, don't hear it. And you don't have to uh, come to the counseling session because you're you're wasting your time and your money if it's not the word of God. Doesn't matter who the counselor is. Well, I like my counselor. He or she's not a believer. Well, you're then sitting at the feet of someone who is blind to truth if they're not a believer. And then you've got the blind leading the blind. I don't care how good they make you feel. That is not what this is about. This is about you getting set free by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work at Calvary. This is not about you feeling good because you had a counseling session. Does it mean you won't feel a a sense of awakening and a sense of hope coming from the counselor and you feel good? That's all good. But it has to be on the basis of the origin of the counsel. And if it's coming, if it's not coming from the word of God through your counselor, you are being led by a person who is blind. They don't know it. They're not intending to be, but how can they share with you what they don't know? How can they lead you in the pathway of truth if they're not themselves embodied in that truth? They can't lead you to a place where they themselves have never gone. And therefore, they're going to lead you only to the level where they have gone. And if they haven't gotten to the place of their own freedom, they're blind to any opportunity to lead you to that same freedom. And ultimately, it's only Christ that can do it. Counselor can be a part as a navigator, as we already covered, external navigator. But the true navigator is the Holy Spirit navigating you internally. And that is what transforms you, what the Holy Spirit does within you, and your obedience to the Holy Spirit. So when you are in marital conflict, in division and strife with your spouse, and possibly headed for divorce, you are drawn by the Holy Spirit to head directly to the throne room of God to be restored. It's never wrong to go to him. Oftentimes, I'm sorry, counseling is this first stop, maybe a second or third stop of a different counselor or a conference, second or third or fourth stop. If it keeps you from going vertically into the throne room, in and up, where it's you and the Lord and the Lord and you, you're missing all the areas 
where you can be set free. You're missing it. And the enemy will let you go to one counselor after another where you'll get caught up in circular reasoning. And you know what that means? That means you've gone to a counselor and you felt good about the person that counselor knew some of the areas that you were struggling with. That made you feel good. That's why they're a counselor. They can assess you as to where you're at. The problem is assessing where you're at does not mean they can take you to the place of your freedom, restoration, and healing. Because only Christ can set you free. Only he can give sight to the blind mind of not of not seeing where the enemy is. Only he can set at liberty the oppressed. It's all right there in 418 of Luke. And only he can heal your broken heart. Only he can do those four things. Yeah, can the counselor comfort you in the spirit of the Lord? Yes, Second Corinthians chapter 1 the God of all comfort. But the, that counselor should be bringing the God of all comfort. God, comfort right now this person that I am in the presence of. We are in the presence of you, Lord. You bring God to it. But until it's all God into the place where it's been all them or all the enemy hiding out in places that weren't surrendered to God, they can't be set free. And you can't reason it out of them. You can't sit in a counseling session and say, you've got a hindrance within you of great pain that you've been coddling for such a long time. That pain has now become infected. Your wound is now infected and you're governed by that wound. I can't take that wound out of you. You can't take that wound out of you. Your spouse cannot reason that wound out of you. That's like trying to reason a cancer out of a man's body. Would you stay going to an oncologist, a doctor of cancer, if he or she said to you, you've got cancer, here it is, we'll show you on, on the testing, on the, on the uh, pictures that we have here from the scans. And would you, if they said, well, we're going to teach you how to reason that cancer out of you, that's absurd. But you do go to a doctor a physician on the earth to get cleansed of the infection of cancer. So you will uh, let the methods of the, of, the, of the gift that God has given to them to help cleanse some of this cancer. There's also the hope of God healing it. All right, all that's good. Where do you go then when you have the cancer or the root of bitterness in your soul? What doctor are you to go to there? The great physician. Who's the great physician? The Lord Jesus Christ. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth. That's what Rapha means, the Lord that healeth. You go to him. Well, I go to a counselor. Can I go? You can go to the counselor. Have that counselor engage with you in the intercessory prayer. Taking authority over demonic infestation into that area that torments you. That's a good role for those counselors to, to, to uh, take on. But they can't set you free. I can't set you free. But I can give you the truth where you can be set free. But you must obey it in the spirit of the Lord and in the navigation of the Holy Spirit who will direct your steps and he, he will cleanse and purify you and set you free. Jesus said, I came to set the captives free. That's the stronghold developed by the root of bitterness. I came to give sight to the blind. That's what we were just talking about. If you can't see where the enemy's attacking you, the Holy Spirit's ready to show you. I came to set at liberty the oppressed. All that depression, anxiety, fear, personality disorders in the psychology book of the diagnostic manual, all of that is encapsulated in what Jesus can do for you. He finished it at Calvary. He wants to finish it in you. And he said, I came to heal the brokenhearted. He's the only one that can heal the betrayals that you've endured when you were torn asunder in that relationship. So when two people in the covenant marriage are having serious problems within their marriage, it is time to appeal the crisis to the highest authority. Get that if you get nothing else. The counsel of the living God provided by the word of God, they established the covenant. If the living God established the covenant, then they're the ones and only ones that can set you free and restore the marriage, not the fallen nature of man. So the living God provided by the word of God and by the leading of the Holy Spirit, this will provide you with the daily revelation and direction that you need to walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. It is common to seek counsel from believing pastors and counselors who manifest the gifts of the spirit to bring prayer cover, to bring godly comfort and biblical instruction and discipleship definitely so that you have the imprint of the truth within you so that it echoes off your mind and heart 
that that will create by the Holy Spirit an echo within you so that you obey, not just constantly hear the echoes and meditate on the word, but do the word. Walk it out for the transformation. The enemy will direct you to focus all your blame upon one party in order to keep you from seeking much needed healing and restoration from the Spirit of God in you. If you're again perceived as the victim spouse, remember, it's not about victimization here. God wants to use what's happening in that prodigal spouse, that rebellious one, to transform you. And did you ever consider that God is preparing for the restoration of the marriage after your restoration? After your transformation, well, you're thinking, no, no, he needs to get restored. She needs to get restored. Everything will be fine. No, no. They actually, it's happened when the prodigal got restored and had the insight and the clarity to know and understand they weren't ready to reunite with their spouse because even though they were the ones deeply offended, they weren't restored yet. So there would be conflict agitated by the enemy spirit activity in the one who's not set free. Now, both are going to be tempted. That's not going to end. The difference is the stronghold where the enemy had way too much authority in the soul of one or both of, of the uh, spouses. That has to be eradicated. You, you can't live like that. You can be together in the same house, but it'll be nothing but torment. It'll be, it'll be living hell here on earth. So the battle belongs to the Lord. In conclusion, if the covenant that God established involves you and God in your marriage, then the healing you both so desperately need must be sought through Christ and his finished work at Calvary, or you will not be delivered from the iniquity that led the two of you into this conflict and strife. Pure and simple, thus saith the Lord. So everything begins with God. Our beginning here on earth, our creation in, in the womb of our, our mother, begins with God, right? Everything begins with God. Coming into the marital situation, into the covenant of God. Our destiny to living as if God is living through me, the vision and, and, and the dreams and the purpose of why I'm here. That all begins with God, originates in God and walking out my destiny. The, the freedom that I need from the from the impact of pain and wounds in my life, that the freedom comes only from the Lord, only from Him. Why are we, why are we thinking someone else is going to bring that to us? Again, I'm not negating the counsel. The gifts of the church are there to edify one another. God ordained that. There's no trampling of that. The preaching and the teaching and the exhortation, all of that. Those gifts are manifest so that we can edify one another and that so we can comfort one another and, and so on. But ultimately, it, it's all God or none of God in these areas, particularly with, the, with this, uh, the struggle of restoration in the marriage. This battle belongs to the Lord, not you, not your counselor, not your family, not your friends, not anyone, but he who died for you. The battle belongs to him. That's it. That's it. You'll understand this better as we get you walking it out in our discipleship. So come and join us at Walking Through Calvary. You can sign up now. We just finished our last one. We're ready to start our next one in May. So you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lusts. You ask not, you receive not because you ask not. James 4, 3. Let's have a prayer for that freedom. Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we, we must take this serious, more serious than anything else that faces us. And that is, everything begins with you. Everything is sustained by you. Everything ends throughout this life, this destiny, this legacy that we will leave behind in you. And if we don't have a destiny, if we're not walking out our destiny, then we won't have a legacy. Lord, bring conviction, deep conviction to everyone who's listening now and in the days ahead. But not just listening, but to obey. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. That they walk out in obedience what they hear to be the truth. That they know it applies to them specifically. And that they are to focus on letting God transform them individually. And But it's through that that you will often transform their spouse. You will use them, but ultimately it will be you and your power and finished work at Calvary. 
best way to change another is to begin by letting God transform me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Hope to see you in walking through Calvary.